And now I want to introduce Ricardo, who most of you need no introduction. He is the president of Georgia Right to Life. Uh, I've known Ricardo for almost 20 years. Um, a couple of my sons call his son brother and have enjoyed times, a lot of times together with Micaiah. Um, Ricardo, I count as a privilege to um, call him a dear friend. He is a godly man, a humble man, a man of courage, and a man of prayer. So I, with anticipation, um, introduce Ricardo Davis to you this morning. Thank you, my brother. Well, good morning, everyone. Brother Aaron, thank you. Thank you to the leadership team here for the opportunity to address you all this morning on Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. And Lord, we thank you. You are the Lord of all life. And you've called each of us to be your ambassadors in a culture that desperately needs the gospel. So let us begin with a word of prayer. Holy Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come to you. And as Phil noted a minute ago, to lift up to you, Father, the great weight that is upon this nation, the great scourge that millions upon millions of children this year have perished, snatched from their mother's wombs, Lord. Father, we cry out for mercy because we know from history the end of nations that go down this road. Revive your church, O oh Lord. Use us, Father, in proclaiming and living out the gospel to stop, to end it, Father, that every life would be cherished in this, in this nation, in this community. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, over the last year uh, here at Sovereign Grace Church, we've been going through Peter's epistles. We've now started in James' epistle, and we've taken a little break there. We're about halfway through. Um, but in the process of that, God has been strengthening us. He's been testing our faith. He's been making us resilient. And I believe that that is absolutely necessary for the day that we are in today and for the hour that we are in this moment. Now more than ever, and if you have your Bibles or if you have your smartphone, if you could turn to Hebrews 5, now more than ever, we must ask of God to open the eyes of our understanding so that we can hear and see the messages in our culture through the, the lens of the word of God so that we can discern the good and the evil around us. Now, in Hebrews 5, for everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to discern good and evil. And I, it is my prayer that my message and my encouragement to you will be useful for you as you train yourself, as you train yourself with the word of God to distinguish good and evil around you and to be God's hands and feet of mercy in our broken world. Now, today, 
My subject is going to be biblical justice and the sanctity of life. So you can think of this as a prequel to Phil's class if you all are going to be joining today. Um, we're going to start in Micah chapter 6. So if you can turn there, please. Please stand with me as we come before the Lord and confess our need and his desire. Again, this is the word of the Lord from Micah chapter 6. He has told you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Amen and amen. You may be seated. By the question that the prophet asked, we see that it is not enough just to respond to the cries in the culture because things were just as messed up and evil in Micah's day as it is today. It is not just enough to respond to the cries of injustice by doing what the world does, by following their prescription for remedying justice. I contend that most of what you all hear in the news, what you see in the media, social media or otherwise, what you hear in the classroom in academia, what you hear in the official communications from your big corporate office of diversity is really a perversion of justice. And this particular form of worldliness, unfortunately, is gaining an ear. It is gaining advocates in many Christian ministries, educational institutions, and denominations. My goal today is to help hone your ability to, to discern good and evil, to hone your powers of discernment so that you can rightly distinguish what is justice and how to act justice, justly, to do justice. So today let us consider the following. Because the Lord God is sovereign. This is my main point if you're taking notes here. Uh, because the Lord God is sovereign over all mankind and establishes perfect justice, we are to look to his law and his commandments to understand the dangers of elective abortion and our response in a culture that protects it as public policy. So let's begin with my first point, in considering the source and origin of justice. Number one, God is the judge and lawgiver of all persons because they are of his creation. If you have your Bibles again and your smartphone, go ahead and pull it up. We're going to go to Psalm 9. And we're going to read there about how God exercises his absolute sovereignty over all mankind injustice starting in verse 7 but the Lord sits enthroned forever he has he has established his throne for justice and he judges the world with righteousness he judges the peoples with uprightness so a few things we can take here from the scripture number one that the Lord God, the creator of all the heavens and the earth, exercises his authority over all creation without limit. So this isn't a question of, well, what's true for you is good for you, and what's true for me is good for me. No. No, this is God has declared that he is over it all, and he is the one that defines good and evil. He is the one that judges all of us. Every human being comes under his justice and judgment. So let's do this, because uh, we can think of a lot of examples. One that came to mind is in Genesis chapter 18. 
from the life of Abraham. So if you could turn, please, with me to Genesis chapter 18. We're going to start in verse 22. Now, this is after the men have come, these angels really, have come to Abraham warning him or telling him what is about to happen to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding area. So the men turned from there and went toward Sodom, but Abraham stood, or still stood, before the Lord. Then Abraham drew near and said to the Lord, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will then you will sweep the place? And not spare it for the 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the righteous fare with the wicked. Far be it from you, or far be that from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? Now, here we see Abraham... He recognizes the scope and the breadth of God's sovereign justice. It is over all the earth. It is over Sodom. Quite frankly, uh, it, for those of you all who are familiar with the whole sex trafficking and stuff like that, you know, Atlanta is known as the Sodom of the South. God's authority and justice is over it all. Abraham acknowledges that the Lord God defines what is good and evil. And he is a God who always does what is right. Abraham affirms the judicial supremacy of the Lord God. He has the authority to judge and to condemn the city for its transgressions. And again, back in 2 Peter 2, when we were there, Peter gave Sodom as an example. He condemned the, city to ex the, condemned the city to extinction in verse 6, making them an example of what was going to happen to the ungodly. So Sodom and what happened to Sodom is a testimony for all time of God's judicial supremacy. And Abraham in light of all these things, appeals to God's own moral law for the deliverance of the city. That is, that the innocent must not die as the guilty in the execution of justice. So now let's do this. Now that we, had a, we got a sketch of what God as the judge and his justice looks like, let's compare this with the appeals of social justice. Now, social, social justice and it's what I call, it, it, it's co-laborer, reproductive justice, emerged as a movement as critical theory and intersectionality arose as the framework of modern social justice. Now, advocates, of reproductive justice claim that women with low incomes, women of color, women with disabilities, LGBTQ plus, XYZ, <laughs> people, they felt marginalized within the reproductive rights movement, which focused primarily on discussions of pro-choice versus pro-life. Now, uh, I have a quote up here, or uh, if we can get the quote up here. Uh, Andrea Smith, in her journal article, Beyond Pro-Choice and Pro-Life, Women of Color and Reproductive Justice, summarizes the dynamic well, and I quote, reproductive justice goes beyond the pro-choice narrative by acknowledging the fact that there are intersecting factors such as race and class that impact marginalized groups of women differently. And that 
this means not every woman has the freedom to choose what she wants to do with her pregnancy when her options are limited by oppressive circumstances or a lack of access to services. So you see where the intersectionality comes in. You see where oppression comes in. So help me out here. So who is the one declaring sovereignty in reproductive justice? And, and, and this is not a rhetorical question. I'm, talk to me, folks. I, I, you know, I grew up in churches where you know, people said, amen. And, and they were, when, when, the, when the preacher asked a question, they responded. So who is the one declaring sovereignty here? Yeah, it's the woman, right? It's the woman who is sovereign, in particular over her own body. Now, another question. Are there limits to the woman's sovereignty based on what you're reading here? Are there? No, there aren't. Okay, who defines what's good and evil? What's right for her body. Who decides that? Yeah, the woman. There's no other reference. There's no other morality that trumps what she wants to do with her body. Okay, now, how is oppression defined? Okay. Hmm? Well, yeah, it's the circumstances. In particular, when the woman can't do what she wants to do, that's oppression. When she is not given the ability to carry out what she wants to do in her sovereign will, that is oppression. When she's not given access to do what she wants to do with her body, that is oppression. So. And, and if you're wondering well, that where the whole LGBT XYZ thing comes in, the organization Urge, which is Unite for Reproductive and Gender Equality, I think says it best. They exist and they are promoting, as part of the whole reproductive justice thing, a world where people have the agency over their own bodies and relationships and the power, knowledge, and tools to exercise that agency. So that really is the, the, the nut of what we're talking about here with reproductive justice. This man-made social justice is a subversive attack on the sovereignty of God over all things and his immutable moral law as the standard of righteousness and justice. This undergirding worldview in social justice substitutes God's justice with selfish desires and vengeance. It replaces repentance with an inescapable guilt. In other words, if you don't have, I mean, if, if you don't give me what I want, if you don't give me justice, then there is no repentance. There's no place of repentance. And as a matter of fact, much of what you see today, and I'm speaking as a man of color, what you see today in discussions about white fragility, um, what you see about people essentially saying that, well, you can't enter into where I am because of, you know, fill in the blank, you know, your culture, where you were born, you know, how much money you make, whatever. Notice how when you hear those discussions, and this is a freebie, notice how in those discussions, there's no place of repentance. When you hear people talking about social justice and you just happen to be part of the oppressor class, you can do everything they tell you to do, and that weight is still over you. And this is part and parcel of what comes into the discussion of reproductive justice. You must give the woman to do with her body whatever she wants. 
And because these marginalized women are the oppressed, then you will never get off the hook of giving them the free right and unrestricted access to kill their children. Indeed, folks, there's nothing new under the sun here. Nothing new. Just as it was in ancient biblical history, when the people of Israel turned from the one true and living God, and they started serving idols, they started serving Moloch, and offering their children, so it is in this nation. The reason why this particular sin is so intractable, number one, because there are major spiritual forces involved when we're talking about child sacrifice. But here's the thing. We can't legislate this away, folks. We can't. There has to be repentance and revival to turn back this scourge. And I'm so grateful that the Lord just really brought that to us that, you know, it's not enough for us to just sing about revival. It's not enough for us to just think about what God has done in the past regarding revival. We have to see and ask ourselves, Lord, Send revival and start with me. Judgment must begin in the household of God. Again, Aaron, you were talking about that over in 1 Peter 4. Judgment must begin in the household of God. And we have to come to the place of saying, what do we do with the child? If I can take a note from Jesus in the, when he was asked by the, uh, the lawyer, who is my neighbor? Now, Jesus told him what the law of God was and what, was, what he was to do to obey it. And he pushed back and said, who is my neighbor? And in today's message, the neighbor is that unborn child. That preborn child in its mother's womb is your neighbor created in the image of God. What are we going to do about that neighbor? So let's look at now how we can serve God, how we can protect that neighbor. Point two, if you're taking notes, partiality overthrows justice for our neighbor. Whereas upholding God's law sustains justice for our neighbor. And we're going to turn over to Proverbs 24. So if you got your Bible, go ahead and go there. Uh, we're going to start in verse 11. So now, in doing that, we're going to look at how we actually do justice. But, but before we get there, we have, to, we have to deal with how agreeing with the world's understanding of justice actually numbs us. It blinds us. To the injustice going on around us. It's not enough that, you know, most people, if you ask them, so where do they do abortions? Most people couldn't tell you. It is something that is literally hidden in plain sight. But here's the thing. We know. Every time you hear people talking about it, you heard it all through the presidential campaign, you hear it year after year about Justice, reproductive justice. If we don't come to grips with how we can be numbed and blinded to this, we can't begin to do justice. Okay, so in Proverbs 24, starting in verse 11, rescue those who are being taken away to death. Hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, behold, it's like we're talking to the Lord. Behold, Lord, we didn't know this. We did not know this. Does he 
Or does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who keeps watch over your soul know it? Does he or will he not repay man according to his work? And the answer is, yes, he does perceive it. Yes, he knows it. And yes, he will repay. One of the effects, brothers and sisters, of a Christian's uncritical empathy, because let's admit, a lot of these women that are essentially testifying that they have been robbed of reproductive justice. Some of them really have been done unjustly. They have been truly oppressed. But they're taking it out in ways that are unjust. But if you're uncritical in hearing what this world is telling you, what the victims of social injustice are saying, and we take the social justice advocate's worldview, then what will, un what will start to happen in our lives is we will not begin to see the impact on our preborn neighbor. We will start taking on ourselves the social justice activist understanding of what is right. What are rights? What is law? What is the purpose of law? Why that happens normally is because there's a vacuum there. That vacuum of justice in our lives as Christians is created because it's not being filled with explicit teaching on God's law and justice in society. And what the world will gladly do is it will fill that vacuum with a glorious and triumphal vision of bringing justice to the oppressed. And it's even smoother when they, they package it with Christian lingo. So let's do this. Let's fill the vacuum. If you could turn to Leviticus 19. Uh, and as an exercise to the reader, you know what? This whole section of Leviticus deals with a whole lot of God's law regarding relations between man and man. I just commend it to you to read, but we're going to point out verse 15 because I want to deal specifically with the exercise of justice in the legal realm. Leviticus 19, 15. You shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness you shall judge your neighbor. Now, what happens in a culture, what happens in our culture when we ignore, when we reject this commandment to judge in righteousness? Well, I can tell you what it looks like. It looks like partiality. In other words, we will either be partial to the poor or to the great. And one of the things you see in discussions about intersectionality and critical theory, in particular critical legal theory, is the goal is not an impartial justice. The goal is a justice that defers, it is partial to those who are in the intersectionality. And in this case, we're talking about the poor. Now, when I was a young man, and I'll give you an example of what this looks like as it moves away from God's moral law to man's law. When I was a young man, there was a fundamental shift in the second generation of the civil rights movement. And 
Phil, I hope we get a chance to talk about this in class. Um, where the discussion moved from equal justice under God's moral law, that the black man was due justice because God said that we are to treat all men equally. It moved from that to partiality to the poor and the oppressed. And what we began to see in the 70s in particular and into the 80s is that we had laws being passed. We had rulings from the courts that used the power of government to promote others over or to promote some over others, to give special privileges through the exercise of government. Not, hey, we're all, we're all men under God's moral law and the expectations of justice apply equally. We saw that being undermined. And ladies and gentlemen, what we're seeing today with the whole discussion about social justice is really just the extension of that. Because we did not repent then, we're seeing this become more and more entrenched in our culture with regards to the protecting of the life of your preborn neighbor. We get to the place where we say, we did not know this to God. Because what happens is, as we take the world, this, this worldly understanding of justice, what happens is we start putting others, we start promoting others, we promote the poor, we promote the oppressed in the world of social justice over and against the life of our preborn neighbor. You understand that? So what happens is we start getting pushback. And you probably have seen this at work or heard, talked about this at work or maybe at school uh, where somebody will say, well, isn't it more important to lift this oppressed woman, this poor woman who doesn't have access to health care? Isn't this more important than the sanctity of life? If we really understood the sanctity of life, we would say, well, because of the sanctity of life, we want to make sure that not only is that woman not oppressed, she's not being sex trafficked, et cetera, but if she's pregnant, we're talking about two people here, and God's justice, we cannot slay the innocent in the exercise of justice. Now, while feminist narratives emphasize women's stories and experiences, reproductive justice narratives focus on stories especially and specifically on women of color, women who are poor, those that are living the experiences where we see that they are oppressed. And what reproductive justice advocates do is they say that those that are experiencing these injustices are the real and definitive experts on the issue. So, for example, you know, Jeremy, you can't tell me anything about what justice is because I'm afraid you're the wrong color, bro. <laughs> you know? Whereas this, this black woman, she's like, well, you can't tell me anything about justice because I am being oppressed by a system that keeps me from doing what I want to do to exercise my rights regarding my body and the choices that I want to make. 
You, you, you can't tell me anything about that. What I say in my experience is trump everyone else's. Such empathetic rhetoric allows no criticism of the presuppositions of feminism. And many well-meaning Christians, and, and, and listen to me, folks, this is, this is the big takeaway. Many well-meaning Christians who are drawn in because there actually may be some kind of oppression happening here are then positioned in a place where they ask questions, then they are shamed. You're shamed. If you ask, well, wait a minute, well, what about the child? Well, now you're showing your white privilege. You, you have free access to go get an abortion because you're white. You can't speak to this. You, are, you will be shamed once you're drawn in into not questioning the oppressed. Now, what should be our response to our preborn neighbor who is threatened with lethal force, with murder? I have two points of application. The first is, do all you can to move your neighbor to safety. Do all you can to move your neighbor to safety. Uh, now, I know many of you all are saying, well, I can't take the baby out of the mama's womb and carry him and protect him. So what do you mean, Ricardo? Move your neighbor to safety. Well, it's this. Then in exercising justice for your preborn neighbor, it's going to include necessarily loving mercy toward the parents of that child. In other words, you need to do the works of mercy and gospel witness toward those who intend to harm the child. And this includes tough love. This means we have to be very plain with people about what abortion is and its effect on their lives. It is not the wonderful, liberating thing that you see movie stars talk about. There are hundreds of thousands of broken women whose lives have been upended because they thought that this was the path to freedom. These can be, you know, I know a number of you all are supporters of the Hope Center here in Woodstock. That's one example. You can support those who are actually active in everyday ministering, helping move our preborn neighbors to a place of safety by supporting ministries like that that are counseling women and giving them practical help. Uh, there are clinics, prenatal clinics, like the Atlanta Morning Center down in Atlanta. They provide, and they are specifically geared toward providing care to these underprivileged women who don't have access to health care, who need more than just what I would call, hey, I need my government health care. They're giving them companionship, they're providing a context for discipleship during the months of pregnancy to both the men and the women who were involved in that child's life. You can give, you can volunteer there. And you know what? It can be something as easy uh, how many of you all have seen the little Choose Life license plates? Raise your hand if you've seen the little Choose Life license plate. Go, yeah, Ricardo, we've seen your car. You know what? <laughs> when you buy that tag, and when you renew every year, a portion of that fee helps fund 
moving children who are at risk of being killed to a place of safety all across the state of Georgia. And you, if you're taking notes, go to Choose Life Georgia or ChooseLifeGA.org. And with something like that, it has a double effect. Because not only are, is your giving actively working to move your preborn neighbors out of danger into a place of safety, but the folks behind you <laughs> that are looking at your license plate are seeing a testimony that I can, I can testify. Lives have been changed. Lives have been saved because God used that at that moment along with all the other witnesses in their life to convince them to choose life for their child. Don't limit yourself, folks. You can, you can jump into the pool with something easy like a license plate, but if God has given you a burden for this, oh, there are so many other things that you can do. And if you have questions about that, talk to Phil. Talk to me. We'll be glad to plug you in. Even if, for example, if you all want to go out and do sidewalk counseling, if you want to basically go to the gates of hell and minister, I, I would count it an honor to go with you and bring you into the fight because God does glorious things right there at the door of death. Second item. So we looked at, okay, we need to move our neighbor, our preborn neighbor to safety. The second thing is we need to exercise judicial sanctions toward those who reject mercy. Do we have that on the, on, the, on the screen there? I thought we had it on the screen there. We need to exercise judicial sanctions toward those who reject mercy. Now to do that, brothers and sisters, we need to work and build the culture that rejects abortion and establishes a legal framework to apply strong sanctions to deter the practice. Because when abortion was illegal in this nation, it was still happening. But it was a criminal offense. That's why it wasn't pervasive. When our culture began to drift from God, we saw an uptick in abortion, and then we saw the lack of exercising the sanctions because the culture was generally, man, eh, if she wants to do that, that's fine. And then it led to the point where we got to states actually repealing their laws, and then when they were challenged, we had Roe versus Wade. So in order to bring about justice for our preborn neighbor by exercising judicial sanctions, we don't start with the Supreme Court. We don't start with the federal legislature. We start right here in Cherokee County. We start here in Cobb County. We start in our churches and in our homes. Ever since the unjust, unconstitutional Roe versus Wade decision in 73, American citizens in every state have been forced to allow the killing of our preborn neighbors. Now, yes, this flies in the face of the Declaration of Independence where we are, it is recognized that we have been endowed by our creator with the right to life. It makes a mockery of the Fifth Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment of the state, I mean the U.S. Constitution, and quite frankly our own state constitution. But most importantly, it is an affront, it is a straight up injustice against the word of God and his law which says you shall not murder. 
Now, the correction of this injustice. How do we get from where we are today to a place where every child is a protected child? It must begin with the work of gospel transformation in our communities, and it will not happen without it. Amen? It won't happen without it. As God does his work in our communities and in our churches, where we're not just saying that the life of the child is protected, or should be protected, that it is precious in the sight of God, but we actually start working toward that. When we start supporting leaders who will protect our preborn neighbors, then we will begin to see the change that we desire. Now, you all may think this is impossible. Ricardo, how in the world in our post-Christian culture, can we even go there? Well, you know what? You may think this is impossible, but I believe in a God who does the impossible. Amen? Um, let me give you an example. There's a city over in Mississippi, and if you can pull up the first slide for Safe City Pearl. Um, there is a city about the size of Woodstock in Metro Jackson, the, the state capital, just like Woodstock is one of the metro cities of our state capital. In the city of Pearl, the people of God have labored They've actually taken Micah's challenge to do justice and love mercy, to do what they could to place and move their preborn neighbor to safety, but then also to start setting up and building a community that is willing to support the protection of their preborn neighbor by law. And what happened was God gave victory. And for those of you all in the back that can't read that, let me read from the Who We Are page. It says, we, the citizens of Pearl, Mississippi, who believe that the children in the womb should be protected from violence, from the violence of abortion. The governing authorities in our city have set forth a resolution declaring our city to be a safe city for preborn children. This resolution recognizes and declares the humanity of the preborn child. This resolution also urges the citizens of Pearl to encourage the humane treatment of all human beings including the preborn child, as well as to promote and defend the dignity of all human life. And here's the key. Here's how, you can see, here's how you know God was at work. Here's how you see that the gospel has been advancing. The kingdom of God has been advancing. The last, the last paragraph. As citizens of Pearl, Mississippi, we accept this exhortation from our governing authorities with gladness and gravity. We accept this exhortation gladly because it is fully aligned with the word of God. Amen. Uh, the website is safecitypearl.com. If you want to get inspired, Go to the website, read the testimonies of what God has been doing there. And, 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 and read how, and, and, and Mackenzie, shout out, brother, your, your people in your home city, they did good, brother. <laughs> um, you see leaders, you see doctors, you see nurses, you see pastors, 
You see business leaders. They are all gathering together. You see nonprofit leaders, people who are serving in the community. They are saying, hey, we have to build, as it were, a wall of protection so that every human life is protected, including our preborn neighbor. And we're joining together. And once they did that, then they took the resolution and they made their appeal. And I believe out of the seven, the mayor and the alderman, there was only one no vote. God is in the business of honoring the obedience of his people so that his goodness and his mercy will be magnified in our communities. If we are to do justice in protecting the sanctity of human life, we must do this. We, Sovereign Grace Church, we and all the other folks in churches that are listening to the video of this, if we are working together, city by city, county by county, we can protect life and we can stand against the tide. We can be the 21st century Underground Railroad. Now, I guess in, in, when Paul talks about you know, dealing with sin and sanctification, he talks about putting on, he talks about putting off, putting on the deeds of righteousness and putting off the deeds of unrighteousness. So on the second point of establishing justice, we do put on what we see here, what's happening in Pearl, Mississippi, what's happening in other states around the country. But we also have to put off some things. We have, we necessarily have to put off supporting or giving our influence to individuals and organizations through injustice target your preborn neighbor. We have to put off supporting politicians and political organizations. I don't care who they are. I like to tell people I'm an equal opportunity offender in terms of politics. We have to not give them any of our support. If, they, if their policies, if their legislation, either directly or indirectly, puts our preborn neighbor in danger, we need to reject it. And remember, if we elect them, they're our representatives. There is a place for a humble appeal. And there is a place for a humble rebuke, if necessary, to bring the word of God, especially if they claim to be a believer, to bring the word of God to them and help them to understand that God will not be mocked. If you sow death, it will reap destruction and is reaping destruction in our communities. Let's end by taking a few minutes together to pray in groups. And I'm, I'm going to ask as we come together to pray a couple of things. Petition the Lord who is the judge of all the earth to execute justice in our land and to use us in that where we have said with our words and our actions, Lord, we didn't know about this. Let us repent before the Lord and ask for his forgiveness. He is gracious to save the contrite in heart. Ask the Holy Spirit to lead and empower each of us to what we will do as individuals, as families, you know, as a school. We're in a school right now. As a community, 
to move our preborn neighbor to safety and to support those civil magistrates who will honor God's law and protect the innocent. All right. Uh, okay, yeah, go ahead. We can break up into... Um, all right, and then Aaron will close. Uh, so we're going to spend about five minutes just praying together. Thank you all so much. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would hear our prayers. And Lord, you would lead us, guide us in how we pray for our preborn neighbors. Lord, we ask that you would have mercy upon us as a nation. Lord, we ask that you would pour out your spirit upon the church, that you would send your people into the community to proclaim the gospel. Lord, to extend mercy where mercy is needed. Lord, we pray that you would open up more and more safe cities like we see in Pearl, Mississippi. Lord, we pray that you would do this work in our city. We ask that you would pour out your spirit upon men like Ricardo and those who work with him in the Georgia Right for Life. Use them, Lord, to educate people in our state, Lord, to use them to push back laws that need to be pushed back and get, got rid of, Lord. We pray just for mercy, justice, Lord. We ask that, Lord, you would use us as a church in mighty ways, Lord, that you would use us in small ways in this area. And God, that you would build our faith, Lord. Trust in the sovereign God who's at work in everything reigning and ruling over all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Ricardo, thank you so much. Thanks for serving us.